Did you have um, comic books growing up? Um, was it part not, of your life? Not really, no. I mean, uh, once I hit like 11, I started reading comic books. But I mean, before that, not really. What was your choice? What was your favorite books back then? Do you remember? Uh, I started reading Batman, and then I stopped reading comics entirely until, uh, until Nightwing left Batman. And then I have every Nightwing comic there's ever been. And tell me a little bit more about how this relates to Nightwing and where the inspiration came from. It just it, it goes past this uh, this lone Batman running around beating people up, gruffy, angry. Where's the Joker? <laughs> you know, to something that's actually trans translatable to me. You know, it's a guy who trains. Got he has skills. He figures the way he can as legally close to as legally as possible affect the city. It, it made sense to me. Batman doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Batman is by every sense of the word something that does not make sense. So when you were making this decision in your life to be this guy and to start doing this, how big of a role did, I mean, how conscious were you that you were becoming a, a, car, a comic book character? Like, how conscious was that decision? Not super conscious of it, actually. It, it happened so slowly. Um, it's just what I, it's hard to explain. Well, you know, when you think of something, mm -hmm. you, you imagine what it would be like to be, you know, you think of it in stages. And then when you get to the end, you go, oh my God, I didn't realize how I got here. And now that I see I'm here, I totally see what made me this way. Were you... Were you a popular kid? Did you have Did you have tons of friends around you? Did you have a good, good, solid group of friends? That were I mean, I, did you move around a lot as a kid? Were you? Were oh you, no, I lived in the same place uh, for a long time. Didn't move around, but uh, no, didn't have a solid group of friends. They came in and out pretty quickly. But was there a couple? Was there a core group? I mean, because because no. I know right now you've got a team around you up in Seattle, right? Yeah, but even even uh, even my team and I have some distance between each other. We 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 patrol together and we do those kind of things together. But as far as like like we don't hang out. Wouldn't your life be a lot easier if there was a group around you that could support you and help you? No. Okay, so the... the <laughs> well, I mean... Sorry. But for example, like, if in, would it be a great world for us to live in if there was 500 of you around the United States who all worked in concert, like, say, a police force, but a superhero, like a superhero force, and everybody had the same general idea so that your presence was felt everywhere? Yeah, the problem is that same general idea. You know, it's hard to convince anybody of the same thing. And it takes an extreme personality to put on a mask. And once you do, you have to deal with all these different personality quirks and reasons for us doing what we're doing. And before you know it, you got 100,000 different views. You know, yeah. the reason my team has been so successful is because I keep them like this. You know, I'm, I'm like super, this is what we do. And if you don't agree with it, leave. What do you consider success in your team? Arresting criminals. We arrest violent criminals. Well, you, you identify violent criminals and then the police come in and arrest them, correct? No. Sometimes we actually go in and zip tie them and hold them down and put them under citizen's arrest. I actually have videos of that. So have you, you've seen the video of the car breaking, yeah. right? We take that dude and hold him down until the police show up. Done. What, at what point can you just can you grab someone and touch them and it doesn't become liable that you might get turned around and somebody might do what just happened last week? In other uh, words, there, if, there, you're, if you're grabbing somebody by the arm and you're physically touching them, can I do that to somebody? Depends on what they're doing. I mean, if they're breaking into someone else's vehicle, then yeah, because that's a felony. So I'm sitting at a restaurant and some guy starts hitting his wife. Can I jump in and grab him? Technically, no. Technically, at that point, what you can do is put yourself between the wife and him. But the minute he strikes you, you can grab him. Hmm. So you can do everything in your power to protect the woman. Okay, comic books. Who do you think is getting it right today? What, what, what movie stars are kind of, kind of capturing it right? Who's, Captain who's America really... was nailed, except for the Bucky character. I don't know if they just missed it. Was Bucky the guy that fell out of the plane or something? The yeah. guy that died? Yeah, Bucky's supposed to be like 14. Wait, his friend? Yeah, he's not like old. You're talking about in the original Captain America? Of course. But who, who today is really able in the media to capture the spirit of what you're about, what the real guy's about? What, what, you mean, what, uh, char what character in the media today do you think really does it? I know you don't probably have a lot of time for television and reading. You mean, and like, what, back. What, you mean like what movie? Yeah, like what really kind of gets the feeling of, in your opinion, like did Kick-Ass get it right? Should no, Kick-Ass is one of the worst movies ever made. I mean, not just the, the random acts of violence and the unrealisticness, mm -hmm. but the lack of intelligence. Uh, you get stabbed once and you don't get body armor, you're stupid. You register your IP address to your Facebook or MySpace account, you're stupid. If you uh, don't have a bulletproof vest when people obviously are carrying guns, you're stupid. If you're driving around with a guy named Red Mist who's smoking weed while driving a car, yeah. listening to Gnarls Barkley, I'm crazy, you're stupid. Right. Thoughts about fanatic comic book fans? I think fanatic comic book fans are cool. I, I really do. I think that you've got to have something to hold people together, some kind of glue. And whatever it takes to get you through, you know, whatever it is you've got to get through, 
I think it's awesome. And if people can relate to comics and that's what pulls them through it, I'm all about it. Yeah. I mean, I can't say that I didn't relate to comics and it pulled me through a rough time. I mean, that'd be ridiculous. Right? Well, it's storytelling. And, and the great thing about comics is, is that you have a beginning, middle, and an end in, what, 26 pages? Well, but no, but the, that's not the best thing about comics. The best thing about comics is the definitive lines. See, that's what, that's what you have to, and that's what people don't get about comics, right? They don't get that the, the reason you read it is because there's a bad guy and there's a good guy. And 90% of the time, the good guy's going to win. And you just, you get to choose the character. You get to see the characters develop 100% fully. There's nothing that's disclosed. Batman comes home, but Batman takes off his cowl. Then Batman puts his cowl on, then he hops in the car, then he fights the bad guy, then the bad guy is truly bad. There's nothing good about Joker. He's bad all around. He hates everybody. He's bad. And you can just, you can, you know Batman crossed the line. You know he went too far, but you don't care because he's everything bad that's ever happened to you. He's that guy at school that kicked you. He's that kid that doesn't make any sense. He's that parent that never wanted to take care of you. That's what Joker is. And you watch Batman just get rid of him time and time again. And the reason they never kill Joker or they never, you know, keep him in the Arkham Asylum is because you never can get rid of your problems in life. They keep coming back. Joker, every one of those you guys. You can never get rid of your problems in life? No, they always come back. How do they always come back? Because people pretend to be happy, but no one's ever happy. I mean, what happens is you, you get rid of the problem that's right in front of you. Totally and disagree. You get, rid of, you get another one. Well, no, because the problem is, is most, people, most people decide that they are a victim of society. They're a victim. I'm not a victim. Well, when you, when you say that people, when you, when you actually say the words out loud, well, of course, everybody, you know, problems don't go away and the problems come back and somebody, you know, these, you have something bad happen and then there's a calm in the storm and then bad stuff happens again, which is, by the way, exactly how life works. Exactly. But I don't so look at life as, but I, yeah, but I, like my opinion of life is, is that it's not the storms in life, it's the calm in life and the storms happen to be the teachers in life. You know how they say that your enemy is your best teachers? It's the storms in your life. It's what you just went through last week that will be your best teacher. You are so convinced that your life is totally fucked up now because of last week. And, and I saw the, everything happening down in LA and I called you up, what's the first thing I said to you? This is the greatest thing that could possibly have happened to you. Which was shocking and weird. This is going to make you, it's, it's like when Obi-Wan Kenobi raises his lightsaber and lets Darth Vader strike him down because under the cowl of Obi-Wan Kenobi, he did what he could possibly do to to get Luke as far along in the journey as he could. He knew that he could only be powerful if, forgive me for saying this, Darth Vader kills him and takes the mask off. So what do you think is going to happen if you actually allow yourself to have somewhat of a life as well? You can't really balance both. You can't? Life is about balance. That's the whole key. As you ask any philosopher who survived who, and, and inspired, I mean, Jesus talks about balance in his life. Jesus was not all about going and preaching and spreading the word. Jesus took off for a bunch of years and went and traveled and saw the world and experienced life and then became stronger because of it. I get that. You know, Obi-Wan Kenobi spends his whole life under a mask and one day realizes he's got he's to get some balance in his life too. He can't keep being angry about the whole rebellion that went on. I'm not, I'm not good at balance, though. I've never been good at balance. Well, I pick one thing and I win. Yeah, but change that script. In other words, it's like you can keep this. I, my, you know, my philosophy, because you've read my book, is, is that you write the character of your life. Right now, you're writing a character who's determined to keep behaving the way that he's been behaving his whole life because it works for him somehow. You know, I never really thought it all the way through. I never really, because I imagined I'd be behind this mask. And in order to do those things, you have to sort of open up a level of yourself. I mean, the goal was to be in the shadows and lurk and stop crime. And when I realized, hey, you can't stop all the crime in the city lurking in a shadow. You know, because I mean, I did this for months before I ever did it publicly. Now that it's gotten public uh, after last week of, of your other identity. Yes. Um, are you more inclined now to start doing more branding stuff? Are you willing to take on some products that you support, you believe in? Yeah, you... absolutely. When it's stuff I believe in. The, the, see, the thing that happened when they did, when they, okay. Um, I forget the right way to look at it. This is a bag of M&M's, right? No, I'm just trying to explain. This is a bag of M&M's, right? We know what's inside this bag of M&M's, okay? Mm -hmm. um, because we bought them on the, in the store before. We've seen the thing before. Hell, if we're going to do product placement, I'm going to give you some other products to put in. No, there. I'm not. This is, you know. I'm this is an example. This, this is an example. But right? the M&M's, which this are M &M's. delicious, by the way. I've never had We know what's inside the bag. Is this, your, right? is this the Phoenix Jones M&M no. of choice? Skittles. But <laughs> besides that, so we know what's inside this. What if I was to take it at the packaging plant, though, and pack something different inside it? You would never know if it was the same shape until you opened it and were just like either disappointed or happy with the new candy inside it, right? Mm -hmm. People see Phoenix Jones and this is the package and they assume they know what's inside it. But realistically, everything in here has been very top secret. It's been kept away. It's been very, very top secret. If you look at the character, uh, the character 
or the person that flat top fighting in the cage ring is, and you look at Phoenix Jones, there's a lot of problems uh, with the con continuity there. You do look really different. Well, not only do I look really different. It doesn't even seem like the flat same person. Flat top hurts people, right? But then on the other hand, you've got this guy who is out there helping people for no apparent reason, hiding his true identity. And then in the middle, you've got a guy who does a little bit of both, where he's a guy who watches autistic kids for a living and on the same coin, you know, protects them to make sure that nothing bad happens to them. So you have to ask yourself, who's the real person in, in all that? Who hides behind that? And, and that's what no one's going to get it, because, because I had to be in this package. The police basically, like, opened up the package. Well, they just they didn't really open it up. They opened I mean, it up. By putting my real name out there, they opened it up because you're all of a sudden have to explain. But we don't know explain. any more about Ben Fodor than we do about Phoenix Jones. No, but you know there's two sides to one person, though. Before, there was just Jones. Now there's Jones and there's this fighter guy. And there has to be an explanation for it. People want to know the difference. And, and I have to... My, it, it answers the question for me. I have to be able to explain the difference. I have to say, well, yeah, of course I'll walk around and I'll, you know, I'll help people out on the street. But yeah, on the other coin, I hurt people in the ring on purpose. I've got to be able to explain that. So what about... I don't know if I can ask this. You saw Super, right? Yeah, I saw Super. I mean, that, the, when, when uh, Ellen Page finally goes nuts on that guy that she finds in the street mm -hmm. and just crushes his legs. Yes. You ever feel like that? I feel like just wanting to take it a little further. Like hurt people? Like somebody has, has really pushed it, with push, is pushing it to the point. Like how do you stop yourself from, from really just... Because, I mean, the heat of the moment, you, your energy's up, you're, you're, you're surrounded. Like, I mean, the things that I've seen that you've thrown yourself in the middle of, how do, you, how do you restrict that final thing so that it just doesn't turn completely ugly? Like, how, did you, how do you stop yourself from that? Because all of us want to do that. We, we all want to ram into somebody that's pissing us. Everybody wants to do that at some point. But mm -hmm. you're, you're in a position where, you know, you're walking that fine line a lot, right? When you really could, could go a little further. Like, that girl was chasing you last week. I mean, she's the shoe? You, well, this shoes is a little silly, but you know yeah. the analogy of that. Well, the, the, the difference is this being prepared. See, it's it's silly because it's a woman hitting me with a shoe, but I mean most fights I'm in are just generally silly. I mean I have over twenty something cage fights, three different black belts, three different types of martial arts. I'm in great shape. Right. Um, most fights I'm in are just like that girl hitting me with the shoe. They're just foolish. Um, I never really get to the point where I feel threatened, and when I do feel threatened, I act I act accordingly. Um, but I never have to go over the line because I'm always in control. Mm -hmm. Like people watch the video and they're like, "Well, wait a minute, you know that girl was hitting you over the head with the shoe while you just ran around." Absolutely, I'm well, trying to the stall. Right thing to do. That was yeah, I'm trying to stall, get the police there, get them to do their job. You right. know, um, I've never been in a situation where I had to take it over the line because it's equal escalation. But I'm always smarter than them. Mm -hmm. I guess the day is going to be a question is when I meet someone who's actually intelligent and with fight skills that delights to do petty crime. So how do, you, how do you prep for that day? Do you, do you put yourself in it or do you just stay focused in the moment and what you're with? Or are you consciously aware that somebody could be the evil equivalent of Phoenix Jones? I don't think you can be the evil equi equivalent of Phoenix Jones. And the reason for that is, um, one, arrogance. And two, that when I walk around the streets, I'm a symbol. People see it and they recognize it. If you start lighting stuff on fire, for example, and walk around wearing a jerker mask, it's going to be less than 10 minutes before you get arrested. I mean, you can't walk around the city wearing a joker mask lighting stuff on fire. You just, you just get arrested. You can't be a symbol of anarchy anymore. This, the government just won't stand for it. Mm -hmm. You can't even be a symbol of good anymore and the government won't stand for it, like the trumped-up charges last month or last week or whatever. It's just um, it's hard to be a supervillain. It's easy to be a superhero. You are never going to get to be a supervillain to the level of Phoenix Jones. It's never going to happen. I mean... Yeah, but people... I mean, a year ago, we would say someone like Phoenix Jones would never happen. I mean, when Peter, when I first found out about the real life superhero community and I met them, it's extremely, um, what's the word? It's, it's wonderful what they're trying to do. You know, how homeless, I mean, even the little things. There's a guy in New York, I guess, uh, Life in New York or something. Life's cool, I like yeah, it. Yeah, and you know, it's like the guy, he, he I'll tell you, the, the thing that got me interested in the real life superhero community in the first place was something that Peter Tangen had said to me when we first, the very first day we sat down and he introduced this to me that a, a real life superhero can be a heroic act, can be something as simple as learning the name of the homeless guy in your neighborhood. What we do is we challenge apathy. It's the biggest supervillain you're ever gonna get and it's in every person in the world. At one moment you can be a normal guy and the next moment you're the villain apathy. And by me standing there in this suit, drawing attention to it, mm -hmm. it makes you being that character way less attractive. You're not gonna wanna be the guy who's socking another dude in the face when I show up with a camera and 20 of my buddies 
and we're saying, hey, man, why are you being a jerk? Phoenix, I, I've, I've been involved with Wizard for about a year or so, um, and, and I, I love the, the comic book community for so many reasons. I, I grew up with comic books, um, but one of the things that I think is so amazing about what is happening to you in your life is there's actually a, a precedent that's been set in thousands of comic books for what do you do when you get unmasked? What do you do when there's a corrupt cop? What do you do when you get whatever the situation is that could possibly happen? It's been thought about in a comic book. The things you're experiencing in real life have been thought about. So are, are comic book fans being prepared for this? I mean, that, That's what I wanted to say is like that they already get it. They're already through the stigma of the suit. They're already through the guy fights crime thing. They get it. So now it, they, you have to... Comic books changed recently in the last 10 years. They changed. Um, people used to say, one-dimensional character. Guy fights crime, dresses up in a suit, gets superpowers done. People started the deconstruction of superheroes. They started breaking them down. They, they started figuring out, you know, why is Rorschach from The Watchmen the way he is? Why is Ozzy Medeus the way he is? Why is, you know, Green Lantern the way he is? Why does Spider-Man like Mary Jane and can't? They had to break it down and make it more uh, cerebral. They had to put it into your brain. Well, you guys are watching the first person to ever deconstruct Phoenix Jones. We had a conversation that is less about Phoenix and more about Ben. And I don't even think I've said that name in an interview because it bothers me. But that's what happened. We had a conversation about Ben. And you guys at Wizard are going to get Kenny's broken down version of that. And, and the, I think the closest you're going to get to the deconstruction of the superhero of Phoenix Jones. Because in order to deconstruct Batman, you have to understand Bruce Wayne. And in order to deconstruct Phoenix Jones, you have to understand the fighter, Flat Top, and the person, Ben Fodor. And I think Kenny's going to get as close to that as possible. And it's in a way kind of uncomfortable. And I'm very interested to see what he draws out of the... I don't know what he draws after cracking the shell of uh, Phoenix Jones.